We are in the book of Ruth chapter 1, and we are going to speak about a lady called Naomi. Naomi was a well-to-do woman, according to the description of the Bible. The Bible, uh, the text does not dig much into their economic stand, but in that time, Naomi had a husband called Alimelech, and at the time, women, if you had a husband, you'd already achieved your greatest, you know, responsibility in society. So already having a husband, because she was, the Bible says she had a husband, her stature in society was high. Naomi did not only have a husband, Naomi had two boys. Now that was a double bonus. Because as a woman in that culture then, if you had one son, well, you are good. If you had two, <laughs> you are everyone's envy. Because you have a husband and you have two sons. So according to the culture then, you've really accomplished uh, as a woman in that society. By the time we are looking at Naomi, Naomi is with her husband and her two boys, but there is a famine where they are. They are in Bethlehem of Judah. And so the husband, I'm sure, suggests, you know what, let's go to a place that has food. By the time you're even able to relocate, they are not doing badly. So in this society, I can imagine there were people who you look at and you're like, you know, those guys, that family. Even we are going through a tough time here, but they are able to live and find better, you know, a better way to live their lives. This is where we find Naomi. The Bible says that in the days when judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. So they were in Judah, but they went to live for a while because of the famine that had come to the land. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife was Naomi, and the names of their two sons were Mahlon and Kilion. They were Ephraimites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab to live there. Now, Let's see, we were going to see from scripture, by the time Naomi left, she was on top of things. She was riding high. She was the talk of the town. Everyone knew Naomi because she had everything that the, every woman in that society wanted. She had a husband and she had children. And then the family moves. So, of course, people, you know, they keep, oh, the family moved, the family moved. You know how we do in our societies, we talk, oh, you know, they moved, yeah, they just went to another place. Everyone is quite excited. But something that the story then takes us to where they move to. The Bible says that at some point, Naomi's identity changed. Because her esteem as Mrs. Alimelech changed when Elimelech died. He was the first to die in the family. So now the lady who was all pompous and had everything going, and the mother of boys, now she's down by one. So that must have shaken up her identity of some. But the Bible says that in the next 10 years, both her boys die. Mahlon dies and Kilion dies. Now, let me tell you why it's, this is so grievous that this woman loses everything and why it's so important. It's because in that community, the fact that these women were in her lives gave her identity. They are what she stood by. They are what she, it was her stature in community. And now here she is. She didn't just lose one boy. All of them died. Now, losing one child is rough. Losing two is a lot. So the story, by the time we are indulging in this story, by the time we are rubbing shoulders with this text, Naomi has lost her identity. She has lost the things that make her valid in society. She is no longer the woman everyone is making noise about. Now, remember, she, not just that, but she's in a foreign land because they left home. So she's a society, no support system, no cousins, no aunties, nothing, but you've also lost the people with whom you came. Your whole family is gone. This is where we find Naomi. Our conversation today is bouncing back. And we are going to use Naomi's story to help us think through how did Naomi navigate her reality right now, the way we've seen it, to come back, because the story ends on a better high. But the reality is I don't think it was easy. One of the things we know is that even with what Naomi went through, the easiest thing to have done with the loss of her husband and the loss of her boys is to give up. You shut down, you give up, lock yourself up in some place, and just call it a day. Because you just feel like life has been unfair. Life has been unjust. Why me? Why is it me going through this? Why did this happen to me? Why did it have to be me to go through this? And the reason why I, I chose this as our conversation today is many of us have gone through things that have asked, caused us to ask God, why me? What happened? Why is it my family that is this demented? Why are my children the ones on drugs? Why, am I, why is my family, why, am I, why is my financial situation the one that is wobbly? Why aren't I the one who is able to make it in life? 
And if you're that kind of person, this sermon is going to be very encouraging. But we find that even amidst everything Naomi went through, the first thing that we see is Naomi acknowledged what had happened to her. She acknowledged what has happened to her. And even as you're having starting to have this conversation, maybe you've gone through some things. But you've never actually acknowledged what has happened to you. Because the Bible says in Ruth 1 and verse 10, this was, so Naomi, the boys had gotten girls in, in Moab. They'd married. They, had, they were husbands to, to two girls, Opa and Ruth. And the Bible says in Ruth chapter 1 and verse 10, they were saying goodbye. Because now Naomi had decided to go back to the place where she knew people. The Bible says she kissed them and they wept aloud. By the time weeping is one thing. Weeping aloud means that something major <laughs> has gone on. But the Bible also says in uh, the first chapter 13b, it is, this is, this is what Naomi, Naomi's words. She said, and can start with 12, return home my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then give birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. This is how Naomi felt. The Lord's hand has gone out against me. Now, you may be here and you feel like the Lord's hand has gone out against you. But we live in such a society where we are forced to pretend. Every selfie you take, you have to be smiling. Actually, when you're taking a picture, smile. And that's the one we share. But then you can erase that and do another one, where you have a better representation of who you see in your mind. Not necessarily a reflection of your reality, but what society has accepted as acceptable. So we are a pretentious society. We are a make-believe society. I may not be feeling good, but when you ask me how you are, oh, I am fine. The Lord has been good to me and my house. We are great. We find ourselves lying. But we don't call it lying. We just call it, well, factors constant. I'm okay. Even when you're going through a really rough time, we have gone into a society that does not tell the truth about how we really are. But we see that the first thing Naomi did was to identify the Lord's hand has gone up against me. You have to first of all acknowledge where you are. What has happened to you? What did you go through? What terror, what abuse, what fallout has happened in your situation from which you need to bounce back? Because many of us don't get a chance to bounce back because we will never admit something has happened. And so we live 20 years, 30 years, 10 years, never recognizing that this happened to me. This was done to me and it was not right. This was done to me and it was not right. I went through this and I should not have. And so the first challenge that I have for us as people who are planning on bouncing back is recognizing where you are. I'll give an example of a GPS. Every time you enter an address in the GPS, for example, you're saying, I would like to go to St. Louis, the GPS would like to know where you are right now. Because the GPS is going to carry you from where you are right now to where you want to go. Many of us want to go someplace, but we've not recognized where we are. Until you recognize, until you embrace, until you own where you are right now, what happened right now, what you're going through right now, you're not going to be able to move from this place to where you want to go. The other thing we have to think about is when we visit a doctor. If you had some pain in your back and you went to the doctor and the doctor asked, so what's the problem? You know, when you enter the doctor's room, the first question is, hello, some you know, pleasantries, and then they're like, so uh, what's the problem? What are we dealing with today? Now, if you went to the back pain, but you tell him, you know, doctor, it's my foot. He is going to start diagnosing the problem from the foot perspective because that's what you've said. And odds are, by the time you leave the doctor, he will have run the wrong tests. He will give you the wrong medication. Do you know why he will do that? Because you did not provide the right information for him to give a fair diagnosis. When you go to the doctor and say, well, it's my back. The pain began in my leg, but it's been shooting up my back. Already in his mind, he's starting to think through the possibilities, eliminating and adding, so that at the end, he's able to give you what you need for the problem. He is diagnosing why you have been honest about where you are. You have been honest about what's going on. Even God, the work he's doing in our lives, we need to go to God with an honest perspective of where we are. Lord, I am hurt. Lord, 
I am angry. Lord, I feel like you've left. This is unfair. And many of us Christians haven't been brought up in a setting where we can tell God honestly. We think God is like social media, where we can just put up appearances. Uh, I don't know how many of us have watched the show, Keeping Up Appearances, Moose's Bouquet. Lady of the house speaking. <laughs> All the time, she's always smiling, the lady of the house speaking, and she goes and terrorizes her husband, but if you wake in, she's... And many of us are living with a Mrs. Bouquet mentality in our lives. But the Bible is saying, and we can see from Naomi, that the only way God was able to move her from where she was is she owned her pain. Brings us to the next point. Naomi kept an open mind. The Bible says that even when all this was happening, just from verse 1 to verse 4, the Bible describes that Naomi had lost. But you notice that the verse 6 says, when she heard in Moab, this is a foreign country where she was, that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. So irrespective of how much pain Naomi was going through as an individual, irrespective of how challenging the situation was, how her current reality was, she was able to allow herself to hear what was going on. And based on what she heard, she was able to make a decision about her next steps. Even when we are going through, if we are going to bounce back, we need to keep an open mind. What are you hearing as you're going through? What we are going through must not shut down any other voice of reason. When we are going through what usually happens, we shut ourselves out. We don't receive phone calls. We will not talk to friends. All the curtains are drawn. If someone sends you a text, you don't want to respond to it. You're like, leave me alone. Let me just deal with my problems. But we see from scripture that that is not the case. Otherwise, God cannot access you. Another person that we look at is blind Matthias. And he's in the uh, Matthew. No, not Matthew. Mark 10. We start with 46. The Bible says, then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd. Please note the word large crowd. We are leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. He was a blind man. In other words, he lived in some kind of darkness. When you're blind, you can't see. You can't appreciate color. You can't appreciate people. Why? Your blindness has closed you in some kind of darkness. Let's relate that to our challenges in life or our dark times or our complexities financially. But the Bible says that when he heard, the same thing that Naomi did, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout. And the Bible says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. 48, many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more. Yes, but Myas was blind. Yes, he walked in a certain darkness. His reality was dark, but he opened himself up to other senses. And as he opened himself up, he heard that Jesus was passing by. And he became, this is my chance. I am getting out of this. Jesus of Nazareth, have mercy on me. And the people are like, shh. He won't hear you. You're making too much noise. It was a, a large crowd. By the time Jesus hears you over a large crowd, you have done some shouting. So now the question becomes, when we are going through dark times, if you're in a dark time right now, if you've been through a dark time, how open are you to other voices? If you have dead relationships, dead finances, dead personalities, the Bible is saying that there is a way out. But the way out is only going to come if you open up yourself to other voices. If someone calls and they're asking, how can I help? If someone sends a text, text back. Tell them I may not be able to talk, but we shall talk. Do not shut yourself out. Keep yourself open because those avenues you keep open are the ones God is going to use to carry on. Because we see that Naomi heard that God, there was a different situation in Judah. Remember the beginning, they left Judah because there was a famine. But after her husband died and her boys died, she heard that there's been a change of situation where they came from, where her people were. She did not shut herself out and say, well, how do I go back? Everyone will look at me like, so you failed, huh? We told you not to be too ambitious. She said, no, I'm going back. So the question I have for you is, what are you hearing? 
Yes, a child may be strung up on drugs, but what are you hearing? What are you hearing? Yes, you may not have enough money, but what are you hearing? Are you hearing that you should go for a financial planning meeting? Are you hearing that there's a workshop to teach you on how to get another job? Because yes, you lost the job, but is it possible that there is a workshop somewhere that can train you to get another job? Do you need to change careers? What are you hearing outside of your reality, outside of what's happened to you, outside of what's going on? If the parent is sick and there are some options in St. Louis, are you open enough to hear that there may be some options there in St. Louis? Or are you so stuck up on the fact that you're going through a rough time that you're not even hearing that there are some options in St. Louis? So we are saying that in order to bounce back, we have to be open. We have to allow our senses and our sensibilities to be able to access information that will get us out of these dark times. The other thing Naomi did is she accepted help. For us to bounce back, we have to be able to accept help. Initially, Naomi judged the help. Because the Bible says that when these girls, that's uh, Ruth 1 and 10, we will go back with you to your people. This is what the girls told her, that the daughters in law. We will go back with you. We've all been through a rough time. Because remember, these girls, are just, they were young widows. So they were also experiencing a loss of some sort. And so they, were, they offered that, you know what, we will go with you. But the Bible says, but Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Here are girls who liked her, who recognized that she was an elderly woman, probably needed some support, and they were willing to work with her. They were willing to go with her. But Naomi, because of her pain, at first rejected the pain. But did not only reject the pain, but judged their help. Because the Bible says that, do I, am I going to get other sons for you to marry? Am I going to get another husband and then have a son, other sons for you to marry? She received their help and judged their help. You want something from me, that's why you want to help me. You want to come with me so that I can give you my children in marriage. And many of us, when we are going through tough times, when help comes our way, we want to be very judgy about it. I'm sorry, but I don't take help from my parents. Yes, it's rough, but I'm going to say it through. And yet God may be saying, just call home. Oh, I'm sorry, but I don't talk to so-and-so. But the odds are God has chosen so-and-so to help you out. I'm sorry, you and I don't talk. So why are you calling me to have a coffee with me because I, you know, I've been through a rough time? We judge help. That's how society has trained us, to be very suspicious of those who want to help us. Why do you want to help me? I find it very unique uh, in this society. That's one of the most fascinating things I've found about the community I'm in right now. And by community, I mean America generally, is we're very independent people. Everyone does their thing. So it will be good for you to also do your thing. Like, so when you live in a neighborhood, people drive their car, click their buttons, the garage goes up, click the buttons, the garage goes back down. Three months, you don't know that you have a neighbor. You are a society that is very independent, which can be an okay thing. But the reality is, compared to many countries in the world, you have the highest cases of depression. Because we are not meant to be alone. God did not create us to live in isolation. We are familial community beings. The Bible says in Ephesians 19, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19, it says, we are members of God's household. Why does God put us in households? God puts us in households because he knows that we cannot do life by ourselves. Naomi could not do life by herself. And so God gave her daughters. Yes, God, it was horrible what she'd been through. It was, it was terrible what she had gone through. But God provided help that Naomi had an option either to utilize or to reject. Thank God that eventually Naomi is like, fine, you can come. One of the girls really insisted. She said, do not ask me to leave. And so Naomi accepted. But do you realize that through this girl, Naomi was able to get another child called Obed? And Obed was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David. If Naomi had never embraced Ruth and received Ruth's help and support to be carried through, to go with her back to Judah, Ruth would never have met Boaz. They would never have had a child called Obed. Jesse would never have been born. 
And who knows? Jesus may not have been the son of David. But all that happened because at one point when she was in her dark time, she received help. Some of us are here complaining to God, but you're not showing me any support. I feel alone. And all this time, the Lord has been providing you ways of escape. But you don't like the packages in which they come. One is your enemy, the other is your in-law, the other is your outlaw, and so you're like, I don't want. But is it possible that through all those people you're ignoring or you're judging, God wants to heal you? God wants to restore you? Is it possible that God is trying to use them to move you on? God may be trying to use them to move you forward. But like Naomi, because you're so stuck up in your own pain, and you're seeing them as people who want to take advantage of you, you're rejecting their help. You're pushing them away. But we are seeing that if we are going to bounce back, we have to be open to the help God is sending. We have to be open to receive. And help can come from unexpected places. Most of us believe in help coming. If your family helps you, well, maybe if you receive it. But help can come from an enemy. And many of us don't take that very well. But we see so many times in the Bible where the help that the Lord provided came through an enemy. But if we are open enough to receive the help, God will use that help to bounce us back from situations that have overwhelmed us. Which brings us to our last point. The Bible says in verse 22, So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabites, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Naomi had to go back. Go back from whence she came. Go back to Springfield where everyone knew she was riding high. She was the talk of the town. She went back and she was so different. Life had so harassed her that the scripture before says that when, when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her to, not to go. The two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, okay, this time we can say Springfield. When they arrived, the whole town, <laughs> guys, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? By the time the town that knew you, the people that knew you, your support system, your family, are wondering if it is you, there has been some major changes in your status. In other words, Naomi was not a woman that left. She was not as high, as mighty, as accomplished. But she went back. Is it possible that God wants you to go back to the place where it started? Wherever that is. It may not look so cute. Some of us have been through abuse. And you've never dealt with the root. You just keep going and keep running. It's been 30 years now. You keep pretending. Breaking up relationships here and there. But is it possible that your issue is the fact that you've not dealt? You've not gone back to where it began. Naomi went back, the Bible says. She went back to the place of shame. Because I'm telling you, I would not come back. I would go to St. Louis. Who wants to be top, the talk of the town? No one wants to be the talk of the town. No, one's, no one wants to be made fun of. So you're like, you know what? I am not going back. I am just going to go to Clever at least. I won't come to Springfield. But it must have taken a lot of boldness and a lot of courage and a lot of humility for Naomi to own her pain enough to say yes. What happened to me was unfortunate, but these are my people. Some of us have left church because something happened. Someone said something, someone done something, and then you said, no, I'm, I'm not going to go back. Well, is it possible God is telling you, go back? Your healing is back there. Don't be afraid to go back to start again. We see that Naomi went back and started from scratch. What do we mean? She went, she went with her husband and two boys. And those boys must have been good boys because the boys even were able to do, make something of themselves in a foreign land. She came back with a Moabite, with a foreigner. She came back with someone they didn't even know. So everyone is saying, what happened? How did it go so... What happened? You don't even have the grace to explain what happened to you. 
And some of us have been through some things. And you refuse to go back. You refuse to go back to the place of your pain. You're like, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm okay. I'll just keep going. But for some of us, God is saying it is time to go back. Your next best step may be to return. Okay, you left the last job. But now things have become tough. Call the boss. Eat humble pie. And say, well, do you still have the opening? You may not. It takes a lot. But maybe that is where you need to be. Maybe some of us, it's time to go back to our parents. You have had a fallout. Things have not worked out. And everyone went their way, and the other one went their way. I, I find it very fascinating also in this culture. People can just go their way. In, in Africa, you don't have a chance. <laughs> You're not allowed. <laughs> Sorry, but no. I am your mother, and you're stuck with me. <laughs> That's just how it is. But here, because you're an independent community, people I can just wake up one day and say, no, I'm done with you. Yes, you're my mother, but happy Mother's Day, but no, we're not talking. Is it possible that God is asking you to work on that? Is it possible that God is asking you to work on your relationship with your children? Where is God asking you to go back to so that you can come out stronger? Where is God asking you to move back to, to analyze a, lot, a little bit more so that you can come back stronger? Is it God? Maybe God is asking you to go back to school. And you're like, no, no, no I'm too old. I can't study with those millennials. No, I'm not doing that. So where is God asking you to move back to so that you can bounce back stronger? Because you may be here, and the truth is God has been speaking to you about some changes. Move back home. Move back to your city. Move back to your old friendships. Some of us have fallen out with old friends. And you've been going through some things, and they've been coming to mind. You know, they've been coming to mind, and you're thinking, maybe I should reach out. Is it possible God is telling you, reach out? Kill your pride, humble yourself, and reach out. Tell them, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what came over me. You can blame it on the devil, even. It's okay. You can say, it's the devil. <laughs> it wasn't me. It was just the devil. But it's possible that God is saying that for you to move forward in your finances, for you to move forward as a family, for you to move forward in the relationship that has been broken apart, for you to move forward in any situation, you need to move back. Look at things again. Analyze things again. And like Naomi, have the humility to believe that in going back, you're going to get a fresh start. Because the Bible says, and if you continue the book of Ruth, I would encourage us to read it on our own. Ruth moved back to Judah. The circumstances were very different. Life had changed for them. Life had changed for her. She had to start because their beginnings were very shaky. Naomi moved back. Their beginnings were shaky. Things were hard. But the Bible says eventually they stabilized. They stabilized so much that when Ruth, the girl that Naomi was rejecting, finally got a husband and got a son, the whole town again, you know the town can talk, told Naomi, God has remembered you. God has remembered you and given a child in your old age. So there are some of us where God is wanting to remember us. He's providing the grace to make us bounce back, to bring us back to the table with our friends, back to the table with our family, back to the table with, with separation of relationships or finances, whatever situation you find yourself in. And it's only in following through, only in working through with God, only in acknowledging where you are. That was step number one. Number two, keep an open mind in accepting help and being vulnerable and humble enough to go back. For some of us, that's the only way we're going to bounce back. God is invested in us getting back. Getting back our strength, getting back our health, getting back stable financially, stabilizing in our relationships, stabilizing in our families. But for many of us, we need to commit to following through, like Naomi did. We need to commit to her vulnerability and commit to her bravery so that we are able to move from a place of unfortunate circumstances back to a place of normalcy. In Jesus' name, amen.